Well, welcome everyone. It's one o'clock, so we'll go ahead and get started now. I'm delighted that you've joined us for this session, Servant Leadership on the Edge. My name is Amber Johnson. I'm the Chief Communications Officer at the Center for Values Driven Leadership at Benedictine University. And I want you to know that when we started planning this session six or eight weeks ago, the edge we were talking about was the coronavirus, which has of course been so disruptive for our health and our families and our um, employment as well. And in the last few weeks, we've found ourselves at another edge. It's not a new one, of course, but that's the edge of the racism and inequality that exists in our society. And we have been reminded once again, as we need it to be, uh, of our responsibility to addressing that, for addressing that. And so as we come together today, I think there has never been a better time to be talking about servant leadership. And I'm glad that you've joined us for it. Let me take just a minute or two to tell you about the Center for Values Driven Leadership. We're part of Benedictine University and our purpose is to help values driven leaders develop themselves and others so they can build flourishing companies that transform business and society in the way you want to do that. And we do that through consulting, we do it through research, we do it through thought leadership, and we do it through education like this session today. Um, we also have an award-winning PhD program that's designed for senior leaders and we don't have time today to tell you about the different options we have, but I want to let you know that next week we will have an online session um, to tell people about that PhD program. We'll share some links in the chat function. And I'm also excited to announce that we're launching a new series of webinars designed to help business leaders confront racism and build inclusive organizations. And you'll be hearing an announcement about us about that in the coming weeks. Uh, let's just do a little housekeeping for today. Here are the guidelines. Keep your video off and your voice on mute, please. That'll help cut down on the background noise. But we do want to communicate with you and we'll do that through the chat box. You can find the chat box at the bottom of your screen in the bar. There should be a little option that says chat. When it comes up, you'll see it looks something like this. You can change that everyone to Center for Values Driven Leadership and then send any questions or comments you have directly to me. I'll be the only one that sees those. And at the end of today's sessions, I'll moderate session, I'll moderate questions questions for us. So go ahead and find that now if you'd like so that you're ready and send questions anytime throughout the conversation. Now it's my pleasure to introduce you to Gus Gustafson, Dr. Gus Gustafson. Gus is a core faculty member with the PhD program in Values Driven Leadership and has a PhD in Organizational Development from Benedictine University. He has spent his career as a chief learning officer and in other roles really helping people develop their leadership and think about how they approach the culture and personal life of an organization. There is absolutely no one better to speak to us about servant leadership. His <clears throat> dissertation focused on the topic. And for many years, he was on the Speakers Bureau of the Center for Servant Leadership. So you really are at the, sitting at the feet of a gifted teacher today. Gus, let me turn it over to you. Well, Amber, thank you. Thanks for that kind introduction. And I'd like to thank each of you for taking 30 minutes out of your day to learn a bit more about the concept of servant leadership, its genesis, and how it's just as applicable today as it was over 50 years ago when Robert Greenlee first penned the essay that started the movement that suggests and now has been empirically validated over and over and over again that there is a better way to lead than the hierarchical bureaucratic approach that has been so common in workplaces for literally hundreds of years. And the really beautiful thing about servant leadership is not that it only feels like the right way to think, the right thing to do, a better way to lead, but it actually generates consistently and significantly better results from higher engagement to sustainable profitability across all sectors. Big companies, small companies, private, public, religious, secular, nonprofit, educational, military, and governmental. 50 years ago, Greenleaf gave us the gift of a new way of thinking about and engaging in leadership that is just as relevant today in fact, I would argue even more so, as the stakes have never been higher. Now, I'd like just to take a moment and take us back to 1968. Many consider 1968 to be one of the most tumultuous years in the last century. It was a turning point in U.S. history, a year of triumphs and tragedies, social and political upheavals that forever changed the landscape of America and the world forever. In the air, America reached new heights with NASA's Apollo 8 orbiting the moon and Boeing's 747 jumbo jets first flight. However, all was not well on the ground. The country lost a Navy intelligence ship, the USS Pueblo, and two proponents of peace, Martin Luther King Jr. and Robert F. Kennedy. 
Other events that made history that year included the Vietnam War's Tet Offensive, riots in Washington, D.C., the landmark uh, Civil Rights Act of 1968, and heightened social unrest over the Vietnam War, values, and race. During this time of darkness, voices of hope and light started to rise above the chaos and unrest, promising a better vision of a new tomorrow. Now, amidst the backdrop of everything that was going on in 1968 and the Detroit riots specifically, a woman named Eleanor Jositis courageously stood up and shouted, enough! And she started an organization called Focus Hope, which is still to this day considered to be the best example of a generative teaching and learning organization anywhere, visited by presidents and leaders from around the world as an amazing model for what is possible. At that same time in Arizona, Blanton and Bel Betty Belk believed that there was a better way to channel the anger and frustration of the youth of the world. So they started a, an organization called Up With People, which is still a powerful voice today for peace, inclusion, and unconditional positive regard for one another. And at the same time, a 64-year-old retired AT&T manager sent his personal manifesto of hope, kind of like his Jerry Maguire manifesto entitled to servant as leader. And he sent it to about a hundred friends. That essay that he penned launched a positive and revolutionary global movement in reframing the way we think about managing and leading. And now let's forward 50 years later to 2020. Global pandemics, senseless death, darkness, hope, hopelessness, fear, yet amidst the pain and uncertainty and tragic stories, we're also seeing acts of beauty and kindness. We're experiencing passion and hope. We're seeing courageous individuals stepping in and stepping up to engage in heroic acts of compassion and to listen to one another's pain. Although many of us wish the year 2020 never happened, that it was all just a horrific dream that we miraculously wake up from, that we could have a do-over. Others are providing voices and actions of hope to leverage the pain and anger that we justifiably feel into hope and improvement. Like Greenleaf's voice in 1968, many are bringing their unique gifts and passions to invite us to answer the question, what can we learn from this and what can we do from this? As one way to keep our family personally connected during this crazy time, my wife sends out a daily inspirational quote or meme or picture, anything to remind us of what it is possible when we unconditionally care for one another as human beings. This morning, she shared a really, really good one that I'd like to share with you now. It's written by Leslie Dwight, the creative director and co-founder of Strand Social. She posted this on Instagram about 20 hours ago, and my guess is it's going viral right now. Amber, would you do me the, the favor of actually reading this? Sure. What if 2020 isn't canceled? What if 2020 is the year we've been waiting for? A year so uncomfortable, so painful, so scary, so raw, that it finally forces us to grow. A year that screams so loud, finally awaking us from our ignorant mm. slumber. A year we finally accept the need for change, declare change, work for change, become the change. A year we finally band together instead of pushing each other further apart. 2020 isn't canceled, but rather the most important year of them all. Wow, indeed. What if 2020 isn't canceled? I love this post. Leslie calls us today to do what Gandhi called us to do, what Martin Luther King Jr. called us to do, what Greenleaf called us to do, to be the change we wish to see in the world. And that change necessarily happens from the inside out. And that's where servant leadership really comes into play. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about the man, Robert Greenleaf. I mentioned earlier that he retired from AT&T. The reason he worked there was it was the largest organization, had more employees than any other company on the planet. And he was fascinated by um, ethical management, um, anything to do with management science and, and how to effectively lead teams, especially in very, very complex organizations. When he retired from AT&T, he found himself reading a book one day called Journey to the East, written by Herman Hess. It's a novel, but 
all of those years of experience from a scholarly perspective and a practitioner perspective, all of that culminated in this vision of servant leadership and what that could mean. In 1970, 50 years ago, it was published. It was as provocative then as it is today and equally applicable. I love in the context of where we're at right now, this excerpt from the Servant as Leader essay. The servant views any problem of the world as in here, inside himself, not out there. And if a flaw in the world is to be remedied, to the servant, the process of change starts in here, in the servant, not out there. So this is an actual picture of my copy of the Servant as Leader, what we affectionately call the orange book in um, servant leadership circles. It's only 37 pages long, and it's the most tattered, highlighted, well-used, um, and influential writing in my entire leadership library. And for those of you who know me, that's saying something. Peter Senge recently um, quoted, recently wrote, and he's the author of The Fifth Discipline, uh, so his name may ring a bell for you. He says, I believe that Greenleaf's essay, The Servant is Leader, is the most singular and useful statement on leadership that I have read in the last 30 years. Despite the virtual tidal wave of books on leadership, many of which are on my bookshelf over here, there is something different about Bob Greenleaf's essay, something both simpler and more profound. This one essay penetrates to such a depth that it resonates on us, like the aftertones of a Buddhist meditation gong, calling us to quiet. Rereading the essay, I find myself stopped repeatedly by a single sentence or phrase. For many years, I've simply told people not to waste their time reading all the other managerial leadership books. If you are really, really serious about the deeper territory of true leadership, I would simply say, read Greenleaf. And I wholeheartedly agree with Peter on this point. So what did Greenleaf actually say? How did he define servant leadership? And again, he wasn't expecting this to go to an audience any bigger than 100 or so of his friends. He talks about the servant leader as the servant leader is servant first. It begins with this natural feeling inside that one wants to serve, to serve first. Then conscious choice brings one to aspire to lead. That person is sharply different from one who is leader first, perhaps because of the need to assuage an unusual power drive or to acquire material possessions. The leader first and the servant first are two extreme types. Between them, there are the shadings and blends that are part of the infinite, infinite variety of human nature. Now, he goes on to give us the best test of how you can see if somebody truly is a servant leader. He says the best test and difficult to administer is, do those served grow as persons? Do they, while being served, become healthier, wiser, freer, more autonomous, more likely themselves to become servants? And what is the effect on the least privileged in society? Will they benefit or at least not be further deprived? So Greenleaf's written tons of books, articles, and essays about the philosophy of servant leadership. At last count, I found 168 different characteristics and attributes that he uses to describe servant leaders. Thankfully, Larry Spears, who for many years was the executive director of the Greenleaf Center for Servant Leadership, after Robert Greenlee passed away, he's given us his very own David Letterman top 10 list of the characteristics of servant leadership. So when you look at these listening, empathy, healing, awareness, persuasion, conceptualization, foresight, stewardship, commitment to the growth of people, building community, all of these attributes are described in depth and some helpful resources that I'm going to be recommending at the end of this webinar. And all of these attributes are inextricably linked and do a beautiful job of describing servant leaders. Now, upon first glance, these can seem kind of motherhood and apple pie-ish, like if we just get together, hold hands, and sing kumbaya, everything will be okay. In reality, servant leadership is much deeper and more practical than that. People that think that servant leadership is about the soft stuff have never really engaged in true servant leadership. What I love most about servant leadership is it's a both and model, not an either or model. It's focusing on people 
first and creating the conditions for everybody to be able to flourish and become the best versions of themselves while at the same time relentlessly pursuing the organizational vision. And back when Greenleaf first started writing about this, it was something that just maybe felt good to do. We now know through decades of empirical research that it really is one of the best ways to lead. Now, you may remember the, the book, Good to Great. Um, Jim Collins sorts through 1,435 companies, all public companies that he can go back and look at the financials. And he looked at 10 year period of time where there were 11 companies that rose to the top where they significantly outpaced their competitors in every different financial metric that you could possibly look for. And he said, this is not going to be a leadership book. It's gonna be about anything about leadership. We're gonna look at the principles, the practices, in the organizations that created these companies or allowed these companies to be successful. Well, being the good researcher that he is, he had his team of researchers looking through all the data and they came back to him and said, Jim, I'm sorry, there is something different about the leaders at the top of these organizations. And what they found was that the leaders at the top of these organizations had this unbelievable personal humility about themselves. When people would say, how are you successful? They would describe it as, gosh, I was surrounded by good people or, or um, gosh, I was lucky to be in the circumstances that I was in or people came into my life at the, exactly the right time. But paradoxically, they're able to hold that personal humility with this deep, ferocious resolve to meet the organization's expectations and to blow them out of the water. And it's really kind of this paradox that servant leaders are able to embrace and to lean into both spaces. Again, uh, it's, it's a gray area. It's not, not black and white. Um, and so when I think about this notion of why in the world would we be talking about it today? Does it really work? Collins study points us and tells us that it does. And I've got some examples that I'm gonna share with you of other organizations that have proven that when you uh, embody a servant leadership philosophy and put it into practice, it actually does work. Um, but what I love is, is there's some leadership scholars and the people that study leadership more than anyone else on the planet that have looked at Greenleaf's writings and they talk about how relevant it is today. Dr. Ken Blanchard, who most of you have probably read One Minute Manager, um, however long ago that came out, and he's written more books on management and leadership than I think any other human being on the planet. Ken says, I truly believe that servant leadership has never been more applicable to the world than it is today. Not only are people looking for a deeper purpose and meaning when they must meet the challenge of today's changing world, they are also looking for principles and philosophies that actually work. Servant leadership works. Servant leadership is about getting people to a higher level by leading people at a higher level. And Meg Wheatley, um, who is one of the, I think, the most prolific and best scholars on, on leadership, says, every time I read Greenleaf, I am both humbled and awed. 50 years ago, he wrote clearly and forcefully about the issues that still challenge us today. It is now time to act on his visions. And I wholeheartedly agree. So when I ask people, why would we you know, wanna create a culture of, of servant leadership? Why would we pour effort and energy into caring for our people and creating the conditions for our people to flourish? The short answer is, as, as I mentioned earlier, that it actually works. There's a handful of companies that invested in servant leadership back in the 70s after his first essay got published. and um, they took their organizations to unbelievable heights that they never, they never dreamed um, they could prior. One company I'd just like to share with you very, very briefly as kind of a mini case study is a company called TD Industries. It was founded in 1946 by a man named Jack Lowe. In 1952, it was the first company to offer employee ownership out of all companies. In 1972, they were the first company to adopt servant leadership and one of only a handful of companies to be listed on Forbes' best companies to work for list every year since its inception. So Jack Lowe got, found this, this servant as leader essay that Robert Greenlee put out and started having every single employee that came into the organization read the servant as leader essay. And it's only 37 pages, but it's not an easy read. TD Industries is one of those organizations that unless you look at the most admired companies, you may never have heard of. And what I love of 
TD Industries being such a great example of servant leadership is that it's an HVAC, mechanical, and electrical, and plumbing contracting service based out of Texas. Not an organization where you would think installers that are coming to your home or coming to your business and installing that, that kind of equipment would sit down and have these deep philosophical conversations about servant leadership and what it means to them. And again, as measured by the best companies to work for, one of a handful that's been on the list since inception. Another organization, also Texas-based, that um, started with servant leadership principles as soon as the, the essay was published is an organization most of you have heard of called Southwest Airlines. As you know, um, Herb Kelleher, Kelleher was kind of a radical when he came um, into uh, Southwest Airlines and said, I'm gonna create an organization um, like nobody's ever created before in the airline industry. He did everything wrong by con conventional wisdom. He said, our customers are not number one, our people are number one. And he had this extraordinarily flourishing organization that met consistent profit, record, profit records over 35 years in the airline industry, which is unheard of. And there's more and more and more examples of companies like that. So where do you start? One of the things I really love about servant leadership, the place that I think is most important is to start with the heart. 90% of the leadership development um, programs that exist out there, the methodologies, the theories that list out there, start with the head. And I think to really understand Greenleaf and to really put his practices or his principles into practices is we need to start from the most underutilized muscle, leadership muscle in our bodies, which I believe is the heart. And why I think the heart is so important is it defines who you are. It's where our dreams originate. It defines what you believe. It de determines which direction you lead. It's where our deepest passions reside. It's where vision is ignited. It's where spiritual communication occurs, whatever that means to you. And it's where character comes from. And we all know that that is an extraordinarily important aspect of leadership, character, especially during turbulent times like this. So again, Greenleaf gave us a philosophy. He left it up to the rest of us to figure out what does the methodology look like to get us there. So I'm very, very quickly going to show you a high-level model that's been developed over the course of the last two decades that show the five different roles that leadership servant leaders engage in. The first is this notion you see in the center of the circle of leader as authentic self or servant leader as authentic self. It's the leader being vulnerable, the leader being authentic, learning agility, uh, the leader modeling what it is that they want to see, and also caring for the people um, in which uh, he or she serves in the organization. The bottom right corner, you'll see leader as teacher and learner. Servant leaders are great teachers, they're great learners, and they're great storytellers. They're amazing relationship builders at the one-on-one -on -one level, at their self-level, interpersonal, intrapersonal team and organizational level. Servant leaders, as, as Greenleaf talked about, conceptualization and foresight, also have this uncanny ability to see a preferred future and then help other people see that same vision and then literally build the bridge to get them from here to there. And finally, and this is the part that oftentimes um, servant leaders, leadership gets a bum rap for, is they get results. And they're not, only re they're not only good results, they're significant and sustainable results. So I take into account all 10 of those characteristics, and we've all been watching webinars right now and reading articles about here's the top three things you do or the top five or the top 10 leadership attributes or characteristics that you need uh, to be successful migrating through the turbulent, turbulence that's going on today. I want to really try to sum up the essence of, of Greenleaf's all of us thinking around servant leadership and two of the really most important principles that I believe um, that we have to tend to today. Number one, very simply, simply put, is taking care of our people, ourselves, our families, the communities in which we serve, our teams, and our organizations, and being really, really intentional about that. And second, great leaders have this ability to say, okay, we're gonna confront the brutal reality. These are the things that we're actually living under, but also have this amazing ability to create a compelling vision for the future that looks different than other people and help them um, to see that and to come along where you can start taking baby steps to move that direction. So the two things I'm gonna challenge you to do to immediately put this in application for yourself 
is to think in terms of what's one thing I can do right now to better care for fill in the blank, myself, my family, my team or organization, my community, what's one immediate step I can do to start moving in a caring direction that I may ha I have or may have not been focused on with all the tyranny, the urgent, and all the noise that's going on. And then number two, I'd invite you to imagine yourself a year from now. Imagine you've you've gone to sleep tonight, a miracle occurred occurred in the world. It's a year later and you wake up and everything is functioning exactly as you think it should or um, all of all of the different things that you believe to be true have been put into place. So I want you to get that compelling picture of the future and then think, what's one thing that I can do today to get one step closer to that vision for the future? So I wanna leave you with this quote. Um, Everybody can be great because anybody can serve. You don't have to have a college degree to serve. You don't have to make your subject and verb agree to serve. You only need a heart full of grace and a soul generated by love. It's one of the most beautiful things that Martin Luther King has said, and it gives me hope, and I hope it gives everyone hope that regardless of um, where you are in life's journey, regardless of whether you've spent years of your life studying leadership or you've been called into a leadership role, everybody can be great because everybody can serve. And Amber, that leaves us two whole minutes for uh, questions. From the Absolutely. Group. Well, we promised people we'd deliver content in 30 minutes. I think we can stay on the phone longer and answer some questions. Um, for those of you that do need to drop, go ahead. We understand. Uh, we have just posted the links to information about our doctoral program, um, in which Gus does teach about servant leadership, so it's a good way to learn more. Uh, but now we want to take some time to answer your questions. We have some coming in already. As a reminder, you can find the chat box on your Zoom window. Um, change that box that says everyone to the Center for Values Driven Leadership. That'll send the questions just to me and then I can moderate them. So Gus, the first question I think is a pressing one, which is, you know, servant leadership tells us to care for the individual, but we also have an obligation to care for the whole organization. Um, that's the source of livelihood and the mission and purpose of whatever company or organization we're part of. So when there are things that conflict, and I'm thinking right now in terms of coronavirus and how people are balancing um, work schedules while also trying to teach their children or care for children at home, how do organizations demonstrate servant leadership um, with an eye on the organization and care for the individual? What could you say about that? Yeah, that's it's a great question, Amber, and that is the beauty of servant leadership is it's a both and versus an either or model. So there are, are steps that leaders and organizations can take to create the conditions where sitting down with their employees, what's important to you? Uh, what are you struggling with right now? What are the things that we can do? What are your passion areas that you can lean into right now? And then look at where those overlap with the organization's vision, mission, um, the things that need to need to get accomplished and look for the win-win solution. It doesn't have to be a, um, the expense of the business focused just on the individual or the expense of the individual focused on the business. It really gets down to deep collaborative dialogue where leaders sit down and listen to their folks and say, okay, we still have a job to do and this is what it looks like. Given where you're at right now, what's the best way for us to help you contribute and us to honor you in the process? Deep collaborative dialogue. That's a good phrase. Deep collaborative dialogue. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what did Greenleaf say about social responsibility? So he was one of the first people to talk about this notion of, of social responsibility. In fact, you know, it was written, the servant as leader um, was one of a series of essays. The first was servant as leader at the individual level, and then it was servant as institution, servant as organization, um, servant servant as teams and this whole notion of everything that we do, every action we take individually should be for the purpose of leaving the world a better place than we found it. And this notion of social responsibility to me is such a holistic principle that describes, people, people will always have the argument about this notion of, okay, if leadership is about um, focusing in on a vision and mobilizing people to go in that direction, you can bring up dictators from history that did horrible things that said this was their vision. So Greenleaf embeds in us that everything that we do when we mobilize people, it must be for the greater good. 
And again, that could be in our, our individual spheres, social responsibility within our family, our communities, um, at the country level, at the societal level. Um, and I think he does a really, really nice job of weaving the concepts of socially responsible leadership in it before, gosh, 20 years before the concept even was born. Terrific. Um, when we talk about servant leadership, are most of the companies that are doing it companies that spread the pay among um, among the, the whole population of the organization more broadly? Is that sort of a requirement of servant leadership or is it, um, is it not? No, it's a great question. Um, companies that engage in servant leadership behaviors um, and methodologies, all different industries, all different sectors, all different uh, comp models based on what's contextual to that particular industry. So TD Industries, for example, felt it was really, really important for them to be an employee-owned organization. So that's one of the things that um, made contextual sense for them and their business and to keep their people motivated and exciting and to have a CEO mentality. But I've seen servant leadership enacted, um, again, companies across, literally across all sectors, um, across geographies, um, six of the seven continents. I'm not sure in Antarctica, penguins are engaging in servant leadership yet, but there is no one model that says thou shalt do it this way. It's taking the concepts of servant leadership and a model and adapting it and customizing it to the context of the individual organization and their needs. Terrific. Um, you mentioned at the beginning with a great job comparing 1968 to 2020 and uh, servant leadership as a powerful um, philosophy to consider in times of crisis. Is there a lot, much research sure. that you can point us toward that validates servant leadership's contributions in these times of crisis in particular? Yeah, that's a great question. And for those that are interested, in fact, I will put it up on the screen right now. Um, you can reach out to me, send me an email, send Amber an email, and I can give you a list of the different academic articles, the articles in the popular press, um, here's three scholarly articles that have been written very, very recently, 2017, 2018, 2019, where you've got behavioral scientists, social scientists going out and saying, okay, how do you measure um, not only the results from a people perspective, but also the results from a financial perspective? So back when Southwest Airlines and TD Industries and the early adopters were doing this, they were they were considered heretics in their field. And they were doing it because it felt right and they bet on the come. They trusted that if you treat people right, the results will follow. The beautiful news is for the last two decades, there's been a plethora of research that not only suggests, but actually um, empirically proves that, that organizations that lean into servant leadership principles and practices outperform their competitors multiple levels, both financially and from a people skills perspective. Terrific. That's a great response. And, um, you know, empirical research is hard to find in, that's very specific in most contexts. And so uh, we're lucky to have some good documented servant leadership research articles. I'm thankful for sharing those. Um, and maybe there'll be some great ones written out of this era we're in right now. I um, absolutely believe there will be. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Okay, I'm trying to, I've got several, a couple of other questions, um, and I'm just trying to find the one I wanted to ask here. Okay, so you mentioned the importance of setting a clear vision. Um, is that the leader's job, or should it be something that comes from the, the diversity of stakeholders involved in the organization? Yeah, great question, Amber. So I am a full believer in getting the whole system in the room. Whenever you're creating directionally where it is that you want to go. It used to be the model was you got the CEO and maybe the exec team and they would go away um, to a retreat center somewhere and they'd come down with the tablets and say, thou shalt, this is the direction we're going to go. There's all sorts of large group methodologies, um, many of which are spoken about and taught at the Center for Values Driven Leadership, where you can bring the whole system in the room. And once you've experienced that, you never go back to you know assigning people to create the vision much much more powerful when you can bring the system into the room and co-create it together you've got buy-in everybody feels like their voice is heard and they feel like they're absolutely part of it and it's a completely different level of commitment even if the one thing that i happen to say didn't ultimately end up in the final draft i felt 
um, like I was part of the process. And for anybody that, that's thinking, well, how do you bring an entire system in a room to do this? It can be at the team level, the organizational level, or business unit level. We've seen companies shut down manufacturing firms, literally shut the line off for three days and take all of their employees and sit down and, and co-create the vision of where they want to go because they believe it's that important. If you don't know where you're, you're going, it's the old um, from Alice in Wonderland where she comes up and the Cheshire cat's sitting on the sign and she says, which road do I take? And he said, where are you going? She goes, I don't know. And he said, well, then any road will get you there. The more people that can be involved um, in the vision, the more beautiful it becomes and the more inclusive it becomes because you're, um, you're getting thinking from everybody within the system. Amen. People support what they help to create. That is a phrase we say over and over. Absolutely. Yeah. And for those of you that are interested in collaborative change models, I encourage you to go to our website and search for Appreciative Inquiry. We have um, several resources on it. And it's a great model that we use um, and teach, Appreciative Inquiry. Uh, and one question on that before we move on. When the whole system's in the room, do the leaders still choose the vision or is there voting or debate or what does that look like in your recommendation? So when I, I, I've seen it multiple ways. To me, again, the most effective way is when you've got all of the voices in the room and it generatively bubbles up that it really is co-created. Now, it is ultimately the leader's responsibility to say, this is where we're going <laughs> directionally. This is where we're taking the ship. And, you know, people will say, well, Gus, is servant leadership always the go-to model? Is it the most is it the perfect model for every leadership situation? Situational leadership tells us, no, you're not always going for consensus. So if you're in a movie theater and you know it's on fire, you don't say, okay, well, let's sit around and build consensus about what our next action step is. It's like, get out of the building right now. Hopefully you built the trust up. So when you go autocratic as a leader, the organization listens and follows and knows that there's, there's something important. So I think the leader always has the opportunity to polish, refine it. And if the leader sees something at a different vantage point, sees different things going on in the market that the rest of the organization doesn't see, they can clearly bring a perspective um, that maybe everyone in the organization doesn't have access to. So I'd say the leader, the leadership team need to finalize on it, um, clarify it, uh, clearly articulate it, but the more it can bubble up from the organization, the better, and the more that they can take into the voices. And once you live through one of these large, large group methodologies and appreciative inquiry is a great room, uh, is a great one. You see that it's, I mean, it's just beautiful the way it unfolds where everybody's voice gets in the room and in real time, you can land on a, a vision that's 80%, um, you know, there. And the leader in the room at the time can say, you know, we'll go offsite, maybe wordsmith it a little bit or, or what have you. But um, I think it's, it is, it's incumbent upon the leader to own it for the leader to get as much input and in, insight into it as he or she can and to be the chief advocate of it moving forward, but to bring everyone else along wherever possible. That's terrific. Thank you. And I want to underline something you just said, which is that servant leadership is a sort of a lens. It's a values driven lens that you can put over other frameworks that you're using and use them sort of hand in hand. Um, I think that's a, and and adapt then based on circumstances as well. I think that's an important point to make. Um, for Absolutely. the sake of time, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call out at the questions we have. I have three left for you. You know, someone asks, wouldn't it be easier to do servant leadership if we had some changes in the law? <laughs> and um, ideally, you know, there's a lot of perfect world. I'm wondering if you can just comment on how hard it is to do servant leadership if you're in a publicly traded company or a venture capital situation. What's that look like there? Yeah, I've, I've seen it in every different type of organization. And the short answer is, would it be easier if it was mandated that you know we all engage in in socially responsible behavior with one another either at the societal level or in the organizational level and clearly that would that would make things a lot easier and um, we wouldn't have as many barriers i have not found an organization yet where you can't go in and at least sow the seeds of servant leadership so i encourage people to think about whatever wherever they are in their organization wherever they are what they're passionate about in their community you don't have to go try to do everything at once. It's really the small steps. And as Greenlee said, it starts from the inside out. And Arthur Ashe said, you know, 
use what you have or start where you are, use what you have, do what you can. I've seen organizations that are very, very hierarchical command, you know, command and control organizations where they're pockets of servant leadership. And the most beautiful thing about it is when you get to experience that is the rest of the organization will go, well, we're not sure what Amber's doing with her team over there, but they seem to be happy and they laugh more than anyone else and they're getting results. We want more of what she has. So it's easy to use as an excuse and it's a legitimate and valid excuse. If you're in an organization that just, you know, does not agree in putting people first or does not agree in um, creating the conditions for people to flourish, you, you know, do what you can to change it. And if you can't, it's probably not the, the right long-term fit for you. But I believe that everybody has the opportunity and actually um, really the responsibility to do what they can. And it's amazing how a simple conversation, sitting down with someone and saying, you know, what is it that you really care about? What is it that you're most passionate about? Those little stories are what ultimately build and turn into movements. Uh, you know, the Margaret Mead quote that everybody goes to as, never doubt that a small group of committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. I, I mean, I fully believe in that. It's, it, we're seeing right now in, in the movements that are going on and the protests that are going on, things are changing. Laws are being, being overturned based on people to have the courage to step up into their passion. Thank you. Two more questions. Let's do the lightning round. Um, the first one, Got why it. do you think, you know, so many of Jim Collins' organizations didn't survive? And uh, why do you think that is? I'm sorry, say the question again, Amber. I didn't so many of the organizations featured in Jim Collins' Good to Great haven't survived. And if these are level five leaders, why do we think that they didn't make it? So, Often, to, one, of the, one of the biggest responsibility of level five leaders or any leader for that matter is to build a succession plan and to build people to continue to see the vision moving forward. In most of those examples, the leader who was um, the biggest advocate and proponent of servant leadership ultimately retired, left the organization. Um, many cases, the great CEOs say nobody should be in a CEO role longer than, than 10 years. And oftentimes when a new CEO comes in and says, okay, everything that the old leadership team is doing is wrong. I want to bring something else in that's new. So I've seen organizations that have flourished, won awards, um, people, people come to them for their culture, and then you get a change of leadership and suddenly culture doesn't become, or culture isn't a priority as much as it was, servant so leadership isn't a priority as much as it was, and things kind of go backwards and regress. So I think it's really important to be building that leadership engine of a whole cadre of folks. And if you've permeated through an organization, the philosophy of servant leadership, they won't allow somebody else to come in and change the direction. There will be so much upheaval from the, the stakeholders within the organization. Terrific, thank you. Um, one last you question. Uh, well, one statement and one question. Someone just asked if the recording sure. will be available. We will, it'll be, I put the link up. It'll be on that page. Um, I hope tomorrow, if not tomorrow, Monday, you can watch for it and, and revisit this topic. Um, and that people want to do that, Gus, is an indication that this is a timely topic. Um, last question for you is this. You know, I know people are looking for resources. If they want to do the work of thinking through this a little further, um, I know you've got a list and you can um, share that with people via email. Others are asking, uh, there's the James Autry book, The Servant Leader, or the Robert Nuschel book, The Servant Leader, Unleashing the Power of Your People. Curious, you know, when you look at all across them, other than the Orange Book itself, what should people be reading? Your top recommendation. Yeah, great question. So my top three books, Servant Leadership, which is basically, it's all of Greenleaf's readings collected into a single um, resource. It's a journey into the nature of legitimate power and greatness. We just had their 25th anniversary edition, and that was originally written by Robert Greenleaf. It's a little bit heavier because um, Greenleaf writes in very prosaic form. A really, um, a really good go-to book that's actionable is the James Autry book, The Servant Leader, How to Build a Creative Team, Develop Great Morale, and Improve Bottom Line Performance. You may or may not know that, that James Autry was the CEO of Meredith Corporation for 10 years and, again, said in his tenure, I don't think anybody should be the CEO for longer than 10 years. And his wife at that point in time had been staying home, taking care of their 
their son who had autism and he said, okay, it's time to flip flop roles. So he came, um, he came home, uh, left the corporate world and started writing and taking care of his son. His wife went on to become the um, Lieutenant governor of the state of Iowa. And he writes the most beautiful and prolific. And he really does a nice job of tying the, here's what you do. And here's the, the tangible results you can get organizationally. So that, that, those two would be my go-to books. All right. And with that, I want to thank everyone who's hung in there today for this Q&A. I hope you found it productive and that this philosophy inspires you and you can put it into action through your own methodology. Any closing thoughts, Gus? No, just please don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions. We're just scratching the surface on something that I think is one of those, the most amazing gifts um, that we've been given. And for those of you who may be saying, gosh, was Greenleaf really the guy that put the, the hype in between the word servant and leader? There's some other philosophers, 500 BC, Lao Tzu, the notion of at the end of the day, um, when the leader, the, the people say we did it ourselves, um, that's a servant leadership mentality. It crosses Eastern, Western boundaries. You can look at a book called The Bible, and there was this guy from Nazareth. Um, that was a carpenter. That was a pretty good example of servant leadership. So 1968 wasn't the first time servant leadership was talked about. It transcends generations. It transcends cultures. Greenleaf just did a really good job of articulating in such a way that we could make it applicable and practical to bring in our organizations in modern times. What a wonderful note to end on. Thank you, everyone. Go out and be the change in the world. <laughs>